First of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Jeff Gilmore, and I am with the uh, law firm of Ackerman LLP. I serve uh, as the general counsel to EMA, and I have been asked to uh, moderate this session with uh, two distinguished guests who I will introduce in a, in a moment, one of whom, of course, we uh, um, observed yesterday with a great uh, presentation on profitability. Uh, the subcontractor bid listing uh, issue is one that is not unique uh, to the EFS industry. Um, it is uh, an issue, as many of you know, that deals with the, uh, the post-award practice of winning prime contractors to, uh, to leverage their award by negotiating uh, with uh, subcontractors uh, to secure uh, further reduced uh, prices and discounts. And of course, it leads to a concern. It's, it's viewed by many as an unethical practice. Uh, it is unlawful in some states, about a dozen or so. Uh, there is no federal law on the topic, although there have been uh, various instances where legislation has been introduced, uh, most recently about two or three years ago. Uh, but um, uh, in the view of many, it creates a climate uh, that sets up uh, trade contractors uh, for potential failure. Uh, as their margins are eliminated, it uh, creates uh, an opportunity for loss, uh, which can then have uh, an effect on uh, timely completion of project uh, performance, uh, poor performance if uh, sufficient resources aren't uh, brought to the job, and eventually default. And so for purposes of public projects, it is, um, it is viewed as uh, uh, against the public interest to allow this uh, post-award bid shopping. So the solution that uh, we will discuss today, the pros and cons of, uh, of at least one solution, involves uh, mandatory bid listing on public projects. Uh, essentially, this uh, provision would require that uh, all bids on public projects by prime contractors include the identification of the subcontractors who will be part of the team. Uh, once the bid is accepted and the contract is awarded, uh, essentially the prime contractor is then prohibited from making uh, substitutions with the exception of certain narrow circumstances, bankruptcy, and other uh, compelling reasons that might uh, make a substitution a necessity. So for today, uh, as I said, the two speakers who are going to address this, uh, I guess I'm on, the, uh, I'm, I'm on the window side, and the middle seat is uh, John McNerney. Um, and John is the, uh, currently the general counsel of the uh, uh, Mechanical Contractors Association of America. Uh, he also uh, handles uh, government and labor relations uh, for his trade association. He's very active in uh, a whole range of regulatory issues impacting uh, the industry. Uh, he works with um, other specialty uh, construction groups in the uh, campaign for quality construction. Um, he also works uh, on joint labor management relation issues with his counterparts at various um, uh, labor uh, organizations. Uh, and uh, one thing that's interesting, and uh, this could have some uh, impact on uh, his ability to play uh, devil's advocate, early in his career, uh, John was employed by the Associated General Contractors of America, where he was very active uh, as part of the AGC Federal Buildings uh, Group, uh, also director of uh, contract documents. Uh, John has been a prolific author and speaker and um, we'll provide um, uh, some of the views on, on this topic and perhaps some other topics that have come to the fore uh, given the current uh, uh, political uh, shifts in Washington. Um, now, I'm, I'm also going to advance or uh, introduce in advance uh, Dr. Tom uh, Schliefer, who everybody um, saw yesterday. Uh, John uh, obviously provided a very insightful talk on profitability. Uh, again, he has an extensive educational background, both master's and uh, bachelor's degree in um, construction management, a, a PhD from uh, the uh, Harriet Watt University in Scotland, and uh, a visiting eminent scholar at the uh, Arizona State University, where he continues to provide a, a role as a, a teacher. Uh, John obviously has experience as a hands-on contractor and also as a consultant in the industry. Uh, but uh, he, uh, he will bring his unique perspective as well. Uh, but to, before I hand this off, I want to uh, make reference, this is something that Tom may address as well. Uh, in 2015, the United States Government Accountability Office uh, issued a report to uh, Senator McCaskill 
uh, because at the time there was uh, uh, pending legislation um, in this area. And what was somewhat interesting, and I think a, a good handoff, was the, uh, the first two sentences of the report. Uh, and it is as follows. GAO was not able to determine if bid shopping occurs or does not occur when prime contractors select subcontractors on federal construction projects, but found that the selection process could lead to subcontractors' perceptions of bid shopping. Uh, kind of a unique statement if you really think about it. Uh, with that, I want to hand it off to uh, Tom to uh, give us uh, more detail on the, the lead end of this uh, topic. Okay, thank you. As most of you heard yesterday, I try to break these things down into smaller topics, which I would not have done when I was a contractor. I'd just have one position, it'd be one sentence, and I'd sit back down. Having studied the research end, I take a, a little bit of higher view or laid back view and say, what are the different elements of it? And I'd just like to walk through those for us of what I discovered in just tearing it apart just kind of set the stage for where we're going. The construction environment we work on, there's 1.3 million separate construction enterprises that in the United States, from the one person uh, landscape company to the Bechtels and Brown and Roots of the world. I mean, it's just, and all in between. So there's a whole lot of us. We're a very horizontal uh, industry. We don't get along, and the bigger problem is we don't try to get along. There's so much distrust within our industries, even between association to association, it really makes it difficult. So we don't, we don't get into the subjects like we're gonna talk about today in enough realistic manner. We just take a position and fight it. Subs, GCs, vendors, we're all in one industry and if the job doesn't go smoothly, it doesn't work. There's a lot of reason we should try to get along because quite frankly, we all depend on each other in every direction in the field. And my attitude is if the field doesn't run, that's all that matters. I lecture a lot about office things, I lecture a lot about the business side of the business of construction. None of it matters if we don't put the work in place so we earn the right to send somebody a bill. So the field is all that counts. I'm totally field-centered in my thinking. All bid shopping, add bid shopping to the mix and we got a real problem. So the whole, the whole thing is just a can of worms. How do we solve it? We need to consider the impact, I think, on the entire industry, not just on subcontractors and certainly not just on EVIS contractors, but we need to make sure that what we're talking about works for everybody or it's gonna backfire in the long run. The bid shopping issue has been around for decades and there's no one agreed upon definition. That's part of a problem. We don't, we don't really, uh, this report that was quoted <laughs> keeps going back and forth between what buyout is and what negotiation is and what bid shop. We don't have the line drawn industry-wide that's an agreed upon definition. And if we can't define it, we can't solve it. Now you may or may not buy that, but that's a research terminology we use. We have to define it first before we can touch it. And is it a problem or a symptom? That's a question that I hope we would consider as we do these deliberations today. Case study, I'd like to stop a minute, relax, and take a little role playing. You're the owner of a project. Right? You don't have a choice because I'm the teacher. So you're no longer the sub, you own the project. A nonprofit needs another building. This is a true story, it's only three years old. You need a small complex with a tight schedule. 22 bids come in. This is fact. Five bids around three million, a cluster around five to seven, six million, and another four or five at nine million dollars. Everybody got the position? You're not one of the bidders, you're the owner. Director of the committee is baffled. There's a building committee and there's a director of the facility. You're on the building committee, or you're a director, or you're on the board of directors. Pick your own role because nonprofits like this tap business people like yourself and are asking all the time for you to serve. And probably a bunch of us in the room already serve on these kind of boards. So it's not unusual that you'd have this dilemma facing you. In this exercise, you have to decide. There's not a choice. You're the owner, director, or committee. 
and you need to make a recommendation. Those awarding the low bid, those of you that have already decided, all right, we're taking the lowest one of the 22, your work is done, you can relax. The rest of us who may have some concerns have to move on in the exercise. And those concerns, what do we do? Questions cause, what caused this illogical bid spread? I hope we'd all agree it's illogical. I mean, what, should we take a show of hands on what's the value of the job? The real price, my guess, is around six million. I'm just off the top of my head. It's not three, and it's not nine, I'll guarantee you that. So it must be somewhere in there, the right price. Mistakes, do you want to know more about that? Are you concerned if you grab the lowest three million? Can you make an informed decision at this point? And some might say that you have a fiduciary responsibility to make a decision because you're in the building committee of this nonprofit. So what do we want to know? Has the low bidder included all the entire scope? What would you ask about the schedule? How do they plan to deliver on time? Have they got the lawn lead items covered? You know what to ask. Have they done this work before? Anybody had these thoughts in their mind now before you're going to decide who to award the job to? It's typical of us. The real question, though, for us today is if you make inquiries, those of us in the room that didn't immediately drop out and say, low bidder gets it, if you stayed along and thought about some of those inquiries that you would ask, question is, are you bid shopping? Did we just do what we don't want anyone else to do? A lot of quiet here because some of us realized that something had to be done and it was a little difficult to decide what the definition was. If we must award to the low bidder without question, that's the first half. Is that what we're fighting for? That's a question we should ask ourselves. I'm not looking for an answer, but is that the position that we should take? Low bidder gets it, period, and you can't ask questions, because that's what that says. If not, we're reinforcing the industry-wide agreement that there's no definition of bid shopping. So it's a problem. We're here to solve it, and we don't have a definition for it. This creates the dilemma because we're here to discuss bid shopping for the purpose of preventing an unidentified activity. Again, I'm dropping back to research terms, but it's what we would say if we were studying it and dissecting it under academic standards. We'd say, all right, we've got to stop and define before we can go further. This complicates the question, and logic forces us to take a broader look at the whole question. Most of us agree on the what bid listing means, not bid shopping, but bid listing, and that it affects selection and management process industry-wide. It doesn't just affect us, the sub that wants it, or the sub that's listed and gets it. It affects the process that is what we participate in. A process that I hope most of us agree we want, no matter what our part in it is, we want it to run smoothly if we're going to benefit from it. To the extent it doesn't, we're just creating problems. There's pros and cons, but identifying them puts the cart before the horse as far as I'm concerned. I started to list a bunch of pros and cons, and I said, wait a second, it's a bigger question need to agree on what we're trying to prevent before launching the preventer. Sometimes we get these cutesy statements in there. They just come into my head. Solution, otherwise we're going to have a solution looking for a problem. All right, we're going to decide, all right, we want bid listing, cross the board, period, have to award it. And that's the solution. I'm not sure we've defined the problem. Bid shopping and listing have been studied to death the Fed spent a fortune doing it, so we might as well spend a little time on what they did. My guess is they spent about $10 million on this report. I tried to find out how much, but I would guess that in their parlance, they would spend $10 million in a heartbeat. And I waited. It was 19 pages, about $10 million. That's what we'd have charged them at the university. <laughs> so we should at least find a few minutes and, and look at this GOA report, January 15th, called the Report Subcontractor Selection. It's got a bigger name, but that's basically what it says. They start out with, why did they do the study? 
Subcontractors allege bid shopping leads to poor quality construction. I picked up the phone, called about 15 subs, friendlies. In my role, I have a lot of contractors that I can ask questions to. I'm meeting some today, and you'll be hearing from me someday when I send a survey out saying, would you help me answer this? And I couldn't find any that said it, it affects poor construction. And when I said, well, some have told me or I've read that it does, I got a universal answer. I never heard of that, it doesn't, it has no effect. We got a little bit of a problem if we're saying it does and it doesn't because, again, we're just taking a side and send it into the person we want to change the regulation and it isn't so, they're going to go out and find it out. It isn't so, it's a little bit slimy that it's even, even in there uh, because it's, it's hard to prove it doesn't cause poor construction unless you say that low bid causes poor construction. And a lot of us would like to see low bid not be the way we select work, but for the time being it is and has been for a long time. They're not determined that bid selection occurs, but selection process could lead to sub-perception. Officials not aware of bid shopping, but sub said, however, they could not furnish evidence. It's a tough sentence for me, it was longer than that, but it says, of the subcontractors and prime contractors talked to, in the research, which is how we do it. Many of them said there was bid shopping, no one could provide evidence, but it gets worse. They asked the same subcontractors, has it happened to you? And they got a universal answer, well, it hasn't happened to us, but it happens. Again, it, it's a, I'm, I'm just throwing it out. I'm not saying it's true. I'm saying it's complicated. It has not advanced to the point where we can decide on it. And it adverse, they say it adversely affects timeliness. All of these are quotes from the, they're, they're shortened, but they're pretty much what, they, what the sentence said. They said there's no conclusive evidence. Sub may have the perception of BC. They're already included, accusing us of being wrong. They're accusing us of having a perception that bid shopping exists. That's as far as they go to admit of what we know exists. I'm not up here saying bid shopping doesn't exist. I've seen it. And I'll admit it, I've done it. So to that extent, I probably disqualify myself on this panel, but I was a GC for 15 years, and I'm telling you, it happens. And you know what happens. I'm not saying it doesn't. I just don't know when buyout switches to bid shopping. Now, I do know the extreme. If we're dishonest, I'm telling you I got a price, I don't even have it. I've got a price you need to beat. And I made that up. Clearly, that's dishonest. I don't know how many people do that. I know they do it in New Jersey. You guys in the Midwest are safer. The West Coast, even safer, but in New Jersey they did it. That's dishonest. Uh, the problem is our regulation is going to make dishonest people honest. That's a real question, no show of hands. I'm just asking you, are regulations going to make dishonest people honest? Most subs said they didn't experience themselves, that bid shopping, oh, that was another one that I found fascinating. Subcontractors told them, by the way, I couldn't fit subcontractors, so where it says subs, I mean subcontractors, said bid shopping would alienate, this is subcontractors talking, would alienate subs, and that subs eventually would not bid to the prime. I wish it was true. <laughs> it doesn't, and you do. So. It's in there, but we're not doing it. Actually, we could help get rid of bid shopping if that actually happened, but we want the job. And I don't have to tell you, or maybe I do have to tell some of us, particularly the Midwest, bid shopping is preferred by some subcontractors. They don't care what the number is when it goes in. They know they still have a shot at it after it's awarded. They just don't know who to give the right number to till they find out who's going to get the job. Now, luckily, it doesn't happen to anybody in this room, but it's happening out there. Buyout may create the impression of bid shopping. This is according to the feds. Subcontractors erroneously believe bid shopping when negotiation is normal buyout promise. I went to the dictionary for erroneously, and it only had one word defining it. And it was error. 
So then I went to Black's Law Dictionary because I wanted to see why they're using the word erroneous. It's painful. If we did anything, we need a lobby to get just the word out of there. They're telling us we're in error. That's what we're up against. That's out there in the public record, paid for, considered research. I wouldn't call it a research report. In our parlance, we call it a white paper, but it's there. And anyone ever in the future that studies it will quote that document. In the document, they say the GSA, the General Service Administration, testified in 2000 that bid listing would create more harm than benefit, strongly opposed bid listing, this is the GSA, and they dropped it in 1980. I didn't even know they had it before 1980, but they stopped doing it. So they already had it, now we're asking them to do it again. It's an uphill battle. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, and it might be the solution. I'm simply saying we have to understand the battle. One of 12 states is considered dropping it. 12 states right now have legislation that you have to list subs. One of them that they interviewed, they said, is considered dropping it. One state, the GC subs, it tells the sub what to do. The, the sub bids are submitted to the state. I wasn't clear from this report, I'm not sure they knew, whether it came to the prime and the prime gave them to the state or they went straight to the state, but the state got the sub bids and analyzed them and told the GC, the prime, which sub to use. Now, I'm guessing that most of us don't want that to happen. I'm not convinced your GC or your CM is qualified to make the right selection on who's the best. But I'm convinced that the state, it would be a worse selector. I mean, do we want them making the selection? We're making no recommendation is the last sentence in this report. That's what they end with. We are making no recommendation. We don't know how lucky we are, because if they were going to make a recommendation, it would not be in favor of bid listing. So we lucked out that they were willing to say they're not making a recommendation, rather than just end the report and say nothing. We need to be careful of the remedies, the impact, the entire industry, working relationships and business practices. They affect those, and I'm not saying they're working real well now, but it does affect them if we have bid listing universally. We have a chance of doing more harm than good and fair to subs to say, these are not our problems. It would be fair for subcontractor groups and subcontractors individuals say, wait a second, that's not my problem. Let the GC and the GM worry about it. Let the owner worry about it. It's not my problem. I don't want to be shocked. But we have to consider our frustration when government regulations affect our businesses to no apparent advantage. So we got to be careful that we, we have the right to say that's not our problem. But it is our problem if a solution actually does any harm. And I'm not sure it will. I just don't even know what the solution is. Solution to bid shopping, my question is, is it bid listing? And maybe the first step is getting to know each other. I'm just not sure how we solve that. I'm kind of convinced we probably won't solve it today. But somehow we've got to start talking between subs and GCs, vendors. I don't know that we'll ever get through to the designers or the owners, but that would be caught before the horse. We need to come together for some kind of united front on how this industry should operate. Anyway, I'll pass that on. Thank you. Tom, that was a wonderful presentation. Uh, the most thoughtful one I've seen. You've covered every element of the consideration, and your last point is a good one. Um, if only the discussion between, at GAO and on the Hill were that thoughtful and open to rational thinking, progress may be better than it is now. Um, so I, I want to say that. Uh, and I'll respond. I'll give you my pitch. And I'd like to respond to some of Tom's points to elaborate on them, not to contest them, because they're very wonderful. Um, I'm John McNerney. I work at MCA. Thanks to Dave Johnson for inviting me. I long ago worked with Dave at AGC, and so have to confess, as Jim said, I've been on both sides of this issue. 
Um, at AGC, we were of the view that uh, whatever happened between the prime and the sub, it was their business. The old privity of subcontract argument that that water went under the bridge a long time ago, and the view that nobody's proven that this is a problem, a la the, the recent GAO report, which I have to confess I asked for. We asked Saxby Chambliss in the Senate to ask the Corps of Engineers the question of would the low bid system be worthy of repair in the public policy interest of getting you better projects? We made the same request to Claire McCaskill on the side. He was, Chambliss was on the Defense Committee, so he's asking the Corps. Claire McCaskill asked GAO from the, General, uh, from the Homeland Government Operations Committee in the Senate, and she sent the letter to GAO, which I agree with Tom entirely, was misstated. The emphasis was on, are you getting worse projects because of this practice? Um, we didn't examine the letter before it went over. We would have broadened the inquiry, and we would have asked, are you getting better competition, more competition, and more cost-effective contracting if you had controls against this perceived abuse? So GAO, being GAO, a highly political organization, Congress is always trying to draw them into one side of the fight or the other. So they issued a report that is, is wonderful in its non-committal nature. Um, they said, we don't know, we don't care. If you look at the number of people they asked, it's very few. Uh, if you look at the quality of their analysis, where they said, oh yeah, we talked to some government officials who do this, and they said maybe it worked. They didn't really know. They didn't have further follow-up. We met with them. I took about five contractors to GAO when they were doing the report, and we set out a paper. We had a large national subcontracting firm. We had a firm from the New York, New Jersey area. Uh, we had, you know, and I couldn't agree with Tom Moore. Some of my members are, hey, let, let the buyout process be what it is. I know how to work it, I'm going to be fine. Others of our members from certain areas and certain markets say, hey, it's a battle out there and the stuff that I see is just, you know, bad. So there is no one view, I agree with Tom. Um, yet over the years, this, this issue has bedeviled the industry. Uh, you want a little history before I go to my, this, this past Congress in 1938, uh, it was combined with the, its brother issue, federal prompt payment of primes and subs. In 1938, a Democratic Congress passed a prompt payment bill, Dave and I worked on a later one of those, and a bid listing bill. And President Reagan, or not, President Roosevelt, uh, vetoed it because of the payment provision. He didn't want the industry telling his government agencies when to pay their bills. So it's been around that long. Just to finish a couple of Tom's points, GA, uh, GSA had it from 1963, a Democratic administration, to 1983. Uh, the folklore is Ronald Reagan came to AGC and gave a speech at their convention, and in the caucus before the speech, he may have said, may have said, uh, what can I do for you fellas? And they may have said, why don't you get rid of that pesky bid listing thing? Uh, anyway, later in 63, there was a regulatory rulemaking where GSA said, we're thinking of getting rid of this risky, pesky bid listing, what do you all think? Um, and lo and behold, the comments came back and GSA said, that's it, we're done with it. Uh, the gentleman that testified in 2000, David Drapkin, said, well, you know, we had it for 20 years, it was a pain, it was administratively insufficient, nobody liked it, 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 it caused tremendous problems on jobs, so we got rid of it. Nobody said at that hearing, you had it for 20 years and it didn't work and it took you 20 years to get rid of it. 
is the administrative inconvenience the same today as it was then? In 1984, they passed the Competition and Contracting Act. Uh, before 84, 100, roughly 100% of jobs were all low bid because that's what the federal law required. In 84, the um, agencies went to Congress and said, low bid claims contractors are following our big agencies around the country and buying their jobs low and making it up on claims and disputes. They're eating us alive, we can't take no more. Let us get rid of that low bid system. The Congress said, okay, you can. You can either low bid it or you can have competitive negotiations. Design, build, best value, whatever you call it. But you don't have traveling contractors from New Jersey buying an Atlanta courthouse job and going to war with GSA because GSA is done with them and causing a big fight and having the GC say it's because of bid listing when it was really because of a lowballing prime. So anyway, we did some research and the low bid went from 100% down to 20% of contract actions as of now several years ago. I paid for this, it cost a lot. And negotiated procurement went up to fully 80% of contract, or 90% um, of, 80% of contract actions and 90% of total dollar, dollar volume. So the agencies voted with their feet against the low bid system and they still are doing that. Uh, NAF Act has gone to nearly 100% low price, technically acceptable award procedures. Uh, the Corps of Engineers uh, negotiates virtually any project of any significance. Interestingly enough, the VA is sort of hanging on to the low bid system, and you can pick up the newspaper in any big city and find out that the big, VA hospital job is in deep trouble. They have 10 of the worst projects in the country. I'm not saying it's all because of low bid, but maybe. Uh, they don't know how to buy medical equipment either. By the time they buy the machine, there's a new machine on the market and they have to change the job. So, a little too much on Tom's comment. I'll go through this quickly. So our position is that the low bid system needs to be fixed. As a matter of good public cop policy, procurement policy, purchasing policy. It's not a sub-protection policy. It's for, the, it's for the protection of the taxpayers and the agency mission. Uh, if you don't reform the low bid system, these agencies are going to abandon it. And I am told off record by some at the core and other places, you know, you're right. We negotiate too many jobs. There are some jobs that could be low bid. We're leaving money on the table. If we bid some of these jobs, we may save some bucks. But the system has to be reformed so we get better competition. We also did some research and the number of competitors on low bid jobs is much fewer than the number of competitors on negotiated jobs. So that's our predicate for the taxpayers are probably not getting what they want out of the low bid system. Tom's board of directors of the private nonprofit, they may have considered a negotiated procurement to answer their questions before the award, before the fact. And as in most issues now, as we understand, even federal agencies are going to integrated project delivery. Uh, GSA just did a report that said the only way, the best way to build jobs these days is with lean construction techniques, using building information modeling, and using a new contracting pattern, the integrated project delivery system, which throws the hierarchical contracting pattern out the window. It throws the concept of low bid out the window. Every, every, you know, everybody is in this together and they throw their financial lot in together. So that's our main argument, that it's public policy, not sub-protection. Um, all of uh, federal contracting enactments since 1984 have been going that way. 
Uh, you have the, you know, the AGC says privity of subcontract. Well, that was thrown out the window with the 1987 Prompt Payment Act, when in the most delicate aspect of the relationship between the prime and the sub payment, the government walked in in the middle of that and said, I'm going to tell you how you're going to pay your subs. So forget privity of subcontract. And in so doing, the Congress said, the relations between the prime and the sub are of material interest to the government agency and the public policy of getting a project done right. Um, so we're building just on that premise and saying, you're right. And the matter of sub-selection can affect the quality of comp uh, competition and the outcome of the project. So we think bid listing is a solution in pursuit of striking at a real problem. Now GAO said we don't know the difference between buyout and bid shopping. Uh, and my contractors in certain areas and certain places would say we can tell you what the difference is and we see it every day. So that's what we're working on. Um, like I said, um, the low bid is going the way of the typewriter in, in those, unless it's fixed, and we think that's in the government's interest. Uh, NAF Act has gone to this hybrid. They rate the primes and the primary subs and give them a qualification rating, and the ones they like are qualified to submit a low price, and then the job is, is reflected on low price, is, is let on low price. That does two things. It answers the agency's problem with acquisition and pr procurement personnel deficits. All the government bureaucrats that know how to do this stuff are retiring, uh, and maybe in this administration there'll be more of that. So they don't really have the ability, the time, the resources to conduct these personnel intensive negotiations. And they also think by doing essentially an in-depth pre-qualification that they answer it's a form of bid listing. It's a pre-competition bid listing. I, I identify the prime and the primary subs, and they come in and they're rated on their past performance, their qualifications, and then the ones that make the cutoff, whether it's a color code or a number code, they give me a low price and I award to them on the basis of price only. Um, the problem with that, I'm told by our members, that even with that procedure, sometimes the named subs, if you will, uh, are shopped off the job and the contracting officer doesn't see it. And the burden is on the injured sub to complain to the agency about a material misrepresentation. If, if the agency rated if Tom and I, Tom's the prime and I'm the sub and, and I was rated well, and then Tom, after, after the passing the qualification, substitutes me for somebody else. Um, you might think that's a material variation and doing that was at best a misrepresentation or a fraud on the agency, but it happens, I'm told, and the contracting officer just says, whatever. Uh, so that needs to be fixed too. In terms of the law, um, you know, there are about 12 states who have, which have done this. There's some recent ones. Wisconsin is the one a couple years ago. The primes were into it with the subs on a separate prime contracting law. The subs were doing well in pushing separate prime, which is, you know, the highest form of sub bid listing. You don't even go through the prime. Uh, in a legislative compromise, they said, okay, we will take a sub-depository um, law. The subs submit their bids a week or so before the prime bid. The agency takes them out of the folder, awards the winner, and then assigns that winner to the prime. As Tom said, that is a fraught process. Uh, all the, you know, the assignment, and then if I don't do the right thing, who's liable? Is it Tom? Is it me? Is it the agency? You know, it, it throws the legal responsibility into a cocked hat. Um, Massachusetts has something a little different, I think. Some of you may know better. But it's a bid depository where you send all your bids into the clearinghouse, 
And then the prime can go down there and pick whichever one he wants. So he could pick a higher electrical but a lower mechanical and put together his bid with that. But he makes the choice. So it doesn't have that assignment problem. Um, some agencies do it by administrative fiat. State of Missouri does it uh, just as a matter of regulation. Some local agencies, the Los Angeles School District, does it as a matter of local regulation. Um, so this, uh, and uh, interestingly enough, in Canada, both the defense and civilian national procurement agencies have adopted this. So as far as the Canadians are concerned, it's a real problem. Um, so that's it. So then the last thing I'll comment on is, you know, to the question of prevalence, um, our view is, in the main, that is denying its existence is disingenuous. Otherwise, you wouldn't have 15 or 20 bodies regulating against something that maybe doesn't exist. You wouldn't have the AGC, the AIA, the S Society of Professional e Estimators, and others saying it is unethical to participate in, in bid shopping or bid peddling. Uh, we will not bid to, they say this is a matter of ethics, we will not bid to somebody we know who shops our bids. It's bad ethics for you as an estimator to give a price to somebody you know is going to abuse it. Um, the Justice Department came uh, to some of these people that made those statements uh, and said, wait a minute, is that some sort of collusion, price fixing, restraint on trade? You know, what about the free market? Um, you know, you shouldn't be telling people it's against ethics or this or that to do something. Let the free market reign. Subs can protect themselves. They can walk away. Uh, they cannot bid to those people. They can take care of themselves in the buyout. This is not a public policy issue. And you shouldn't be telling people what to do or not do about it. And we disagree with that. We think the taxpayer would be better off if this shrinking, discreet, but yet still valuable system had some control in it, which is minimal, if you, if you look at it, and I'd be interested in Tom's opinion. You do all the, all essentially it says is, instead of doing the buyout, as GAO says, at the end of the bidding process, you do it up front, where you get rid of the definitional problem. If you're buying out the job before you do the, the bidding, then I think the taxpayer is better served. So I think I'll stop there and see if I forgot anything. That's about it. So that's the subcontractor brief. It's been around forever. Um, again, we had a bright, shining moment in 1938. It's been a long time since then. Uh, it comes around every Congress. In 2003, Senator Arlen Specter, 2002, put in the National Defense Bill a, a, a provision that said, I would like an internet service provider in Pennsylvania, freemarkets.com, to do a study for the Corps of Engineers to tell the Congress and the Corps whether purchasing construction and goods and services in an internet reverse auction is a good thing or a bad thing. Well, it took a long time to straighten out who would do the study and all that. But the Corps of Engineers test piloted the proposition is internet reverse aux auctioning uh, purchasing, which is you, p you put the plans and specs or the, the purchase on an internet screen, you give everybody a number, and they can sit in their office, and if I'm number one, I can push $100, and if Jim push pushes 90, I can push 80 until the low bidder wins it. Uh, the Corps came back in 2000, fiscal year 2005, I think it was, they didn't date the report, uh, and said, you know what, this is the worst idea we've ever seen for purchasing construction. Uh, it couldn't be a worse idea, you know, and you shouldn't do it, nobody. Should. It's a great way to purchase toilet paper or pencils, uh, but it's a miserable way to purchase a construction project. Um, so that was good. 
So since then, that has been a legislative vehicle that we almost got passed one year, where we go to the House and Senate Government Operations Committee and said, will you legislate this core um, recommendation? You paid for it, uh, you asked for it, they told you, they gave you a great answer, why the hell don't you put it in law? And they say, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're always trying to append our sub-bid listing to that. And the idea is, if internet bid shopping for the prime is the worst idea in the world, why isn't it the worst idea in the world for the sub? They are close cousins. Uh, so if that's bad, this is bad too. Um, we've had some traction with that. Lately, the AGC has said, oh boy, uh, no, we don't like that. We like the one, but we don't want the other one. And unfortunately, some of our brothers have said, well, we're gonna agree with AGC and we'll, we'll take uh, the, this bird first in this hand and then next we'll get the other one. And I think that's a mistake. So every time I get a chance, we put the two together, which I hope to do again this Congress. And we're gonna add a third thing, which is, and I'm almost done. Um, you know, the Obama administration put out, some of you may know this, fair pay and safe workplaces executive order. Essentially, they said, if you want a federal prime or construction subcontract or any public contract of $500,000 or more, you're gonna have to submit a legal compliance certification to the contracting agency, and they're gonna check out whether you've been getting in trouble with the labor and employment laws for the past three years. And if you have, then you better explain what's wrong and maybe they'll say it's okay or maybe they won't. So we got a bid listing in that for the brief time this thing was alive and Congress just threw it out. I think the president's gonna sign the resolution of disapproval this week. Uh, where we said, oh gee, we don't want the prime rating our legal compliance with Title VII sexual harassment wage an hour, prevailing wage, the millions of things you may or may not do wrong. Number one, the prime doesn't know anything about that. Number two, the prime doesn't want to do it. And number three, if the prime did it, it could be another leverage point in the price negotiations. So the Labor Department under Obama agreed with us and they said, you're right. So we will rate both the primes and the subs at the same time in the pre-award responsibility determination process. So that was a de facto bid listing that essentially granted our point again that the selection of the sub is a matter of procurement public interest that really is in the taxpayer's interest to put some minimal level of discipline into the system where all indications are by a variety of public policy owners. You know, in the private sector, uh, the big current owners, they don't let the prime's total discretion on what subs come into their refinery or whatever. So that's our pitch. Uh, again, I'd like to thank, thank Tom. That was a great presentation. And the idea that there would be a measured discussion of this before a recommendation came out would be wonderful. And I hope there's some questions. I'm done. Yeah, we'd uh, invite any questions, comments. Uh, please, uh, please let us know if you have any points you'd like us to address. Yeah, maybe there is a system that uh, says, well, not the no bid, but maybe not the free. They do that in Europe. Yes. To Tom's dilemma, that board, if that were a public agency in the European economic uh, community, they would have said, we picked the middle guy. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, that's good too. Yeah. Uh, I would say negotiated procurement. If it were me, if I were Tom's board, I would say, why don't we do a, you know, a pre-qualification and a negotiated procurement? I'd love Tom's view of that. I mean, why wouldn't have that, that you know, nursing home or whatever, why wouldn't they have thought of that? Once you go to low bid, yeah. I don't know who recommended it. I wasn't yeah. in the selection. I was tapped to say, what should we do? Yeah. They were stuck with the bids. Now, of course, they could throw them all out yeah. uh, and start again, but that's what they had in front of them. Yeah, I mean, that's the problem with the low bid. You got all those questions, 
And anything you do, I'd love your comment to answer them. You're treading into people's contractual or almost contractual relations. Why not invite in the team and, and ask them those questions? Have you done this before? You know, how did you do it? You know, you guys know better than us. Wouldn't that make sense to you? You know, and that's what Uncle Sam has said. The problem is, you know, the problem is the problem. That takes a lot, that's very difficult. Uh, they've even gone beyond that solution now. It's integrated project delivery. Um, you come and you help, them, you help them define the scope. You help them define the price. You help them, you do everything. And you all share in the positive or negative outcome of that. You know, you hang together, you hang separately. And GSA has said that's the way of the world. Number one, they only do projects with BIM, and now they, they have a study that says IPD with, with BIM and lean is the best way since two pockets on a shirt, and that's the way we're going to do business for our big jobs. So. Yes, sir. Uh, in your study, when you were saying that the, uh, The low bidder status, a lot of those who said that there's not a lot of contractors bidding on those. And if I understand it correctly, I don't want to say a all job, but when they're federal jobs, there's always that section, uh, I think it's section three or section 12, when you do a project, you have to hire a local person in the area. But in Connecticut, we had a couple of projects where uh, they were federally subsidized and you had to hire a person in the apartment complex that was being renovated. And it causes a problem as a contractor because it's an unskilled person and yet you're taking the responsibility of if they get hurt, your insurance is directly affected, your mod is affected, your, you know, if the person does in fact, you know, he's not skilled, even though they say, yeah, just give him a job as a, a laborer, well, you know, just because he's a laborer doesn't necessarily mean he's not going to you know, trip or fall or get hurt on the project. So I think, I was just curious in your study, if you looked at that portion of it when you were identifying why the reduction in the amount of contractors bidding those jobs versus some of the others, if that was a factor in your uh, research. I got you. And the answer is, yes, it does. I th the answer is no. This study, uh, which was 2004, 5, and 6, shows that you know negotiated selection at the prime contract direct federal level, that the low bid competition is lower materially over negotiated selection. Your contracting there, that is a federal grant project. That's probably a HUD project. And the social policy contracting requirements on that process are a much different kettle of fish. Uh, you know, there's a whole level of complexity there that goes beyond the, the relatively simple, in comparison to that, direct federal project award. We run into this at the direct federal level uh, frequently where there is an 8A, an SBA preferred contractor, a minority women, uh, Native American, Alaskan Native, uh, veteran owned, any of the eight SBA 8A preferred firms. Sometimes they get uh, indefinite quantity, indefinite delivery contracting vehicles, open-ended contracting vehicles where they're awarded a, a scope of performance for, let's say, a military base. And they're allowed to award prime contracts over a period of time to do this. Uh, and that, in, in our members' uh, circumstance, in some areas, as Tom said, it's area-specific, but in some places, the SBA contractor will take bids from the local firms, for instance, in my case, the local mechanical firms, take their bid in an area where this SBA contractor has not worked a lot. Uh, and they'll, they'll take their bids and throw it out and award it to somebody from far away who never bid the project in the first place, based on our number. 
And that drives my people crazy. Um, and that's, I think, a little bit common. Um, Just a comment on that. Any interference, it's called by most of us, that the buyer of the service wants to provide, like who to hire, and some people say bid listing, uh, we expect as con contractors and service providers to be told what we're gonna build, what we're gonna provide, but not how to provide it. So we gotta be really careful on how much regulation we agree to, because there are owners that are telling us not just what, but how, and it's hard to bid. We have a lot of uh, reservation work here in the West on, on Indian, Indian reservations, and uh, many of the requirements say, one of them that I saw, 100% Native American workers. Well, I don't know how you bid a job like that. They didn't say skilled workers, they said workers. So they're adding impossibility of performance. We know how to build what they want built. We don't know how to build it the way they want it built. So, so most of, some of us are against any description of how to do what we're gonna do because we can't bid it. We don't know how to do it. You know, in a perfect world, the social policy intervention from Buy America to prevailing wages, if, if you think that's uh, social policy, to local hiring, affirmative action, non-discrimination, the SBA program, in a perfect world, that you would cede to the agency, the guy who wants to build the VA hospital and just say, can you just let me build this hospital? Uh, without 500 pages in the FAR telling me this, that, or the other thing. That water went under the bridge a while ago. Um, and this administration isn't gonna reverse much, if any of it, I don't think. But yeah, I mean, that's the traditional view that, you know, and that only gets deeper, not more shallow, I would say, over time. The apprenticeship rules are another one. Uh, any of you who participate in apprenticeship programs, uh, as you know, that regulation just keeps spinning up. And it gets close to local hire, city residents, you know. That stuff doesn't go away in, in, you know, in downtown D.C. You're going to have a, a resident requirement whether you want it or not. And you, as the contractor, are just going to have to find a way to ameliorate that. And they do. But in some measure, it is highly inefficient. Okay. Seeing no further questions, I want to thank our speakers, uh, thank the audience.